Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Security 425, Understanding and Fighting Malware, Spyware, Viruses, and Rootkits. Before we get started, let me just give you a brief background on myself and also welcome the people that are listening via live webcast. This is another one of the sessions that are being webcast, just like the last one if you were in here. So I'd like to welcome those people. I'm uh, primarily, my work totally revolves around Windows internals, the Windows operating system. So one aspect of that work is co-authoring the official Microsoft press book on the internals of Windows, XP, Server 2003, and uh, 2000. And that's nice bright lights there, so I could see you all, I guess. I'm a senior contributing editor for Windows IT Pro Magazine, co-author of the Power Tool col column there, which goes along with the work that I do at Sys Internals, developing freeware tools. Some of the tools I'm going to actually be showing you as we go through this presentation. What I do for a day job, though, is work on systems level programming programs, app, uh, enterprise utilities, enterprise applications with Winternal Software, a company I co-founded. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to mention before I move on about the book, which you see there, the black cover and the blue cover, that is the same book. It's the only Microsoft Press book that comes in these two forms. One is developer-oriented, the other one's IT-oriented. It's actually the exact same content. The blue one, though, is part of the Windows Server 2003 resource kit. And even if you have one, I, I recommend that you get both of them. Okay. So this is what, the talk, what we're going to cover this afternoon. I'm going to talk about types of malware. One of the aspects of that is defining some terms that, so we can all get on the same page, even though the spyware malware community can't seem to get on the same page as far as some definitions. I'm going to talk about how malware propagates, how it works, some of the attack mechanisms. I'm going to talk about tools and some techniques to detect and prevent malware. What I'm not going to cover today, though, are phishing attacks the prevalence and how to defeat those and how to avoid them. I'm not going to be comparing products, anti-spyware or antivirus. I'm not going to be providing you general security information on how to lock down your enterprise and all the tweaks you should push out through group policy and so on. And I know I'm going to disappoint some people in here, but I'm not going to talk about how to write malware. Uh, actually, I'll be over at the Peabody Bar later today. And if you buy me a beer, I'll tell you how to write malware. So the, how many people in this room have clean malware off their own system or somebody that they know? So just about everybody. And for those, even for those people that haven't, the problem is just gigantic, and it's getting worse all the time. Here's a, a, just an incredibly alarming statistic. Earthlink and Webroot scanned a million Earthlink customer machines in the first three months of 2004 and found, on average, each machine had 28 spyware programs. And spyware is now... Some, by some, some estimates, the cause of two of every five home user and one out of every four corporate customer service calls. Mitigy, a uh, digital risk management company, estimates that last year spyware and malware cost U.S. and Canadian corporations between $170 billion and $220 billion. And the problem is just getting worse. It's a growing threat. Here's some numbers I'm going to throw out. You've just very briefly here. This is all from the semantic March 2005 Internet Security Threat Report. In the last quarter of 2004 and the first quarter of this year, there were 1,400 new vulnerabilities discovered. And this is not just Windows vulnerabilities, but add-on software, uh, add-on components, third-party software, and other operating systems as well. So Windows is just a tiny piece of this number. But if you look at that, that's a 13% increase over the previous six-month period. 97% or almost all of them rated as moderately or highly severe, meaning if they're exploited, the person that uses that vulnerability to get on your machine either is partially compromised or fully compromised that computer. 80% are remotely exploitable, so that lends themselves to network worm type of attacks. And 70% are considered easy to exploit, meaning that whoever wants to exploit these things doesn't have to write any code. They can either go download the code off the web or it's a matter of using built-in tools of the OS. In the second half of last year, there were 7,600 new worms and viruses discovered, which is a 64% increase over the first half of 2004. And 54% of malware created in the second half of last year exposes confidential information. So there's, despite this, and despite the fact that we've all run into it, there still seems to be, at least in my mind, my eyes, 
uh, sense of complacency out there. There's lots of users even that expect to get adware on their machines. When they go surfing the web for clip art or for free program or go visit certain websites that let, gives them free admission, they say, well, part of the price that I'm going to pay there since I'm not paying with money is to deal with these pop-ups. And a lot of people don't even contact customer service until their machine has gotten so bogged down with this stuff that they can't even get any more work done. And for those of you that have cleaned stuff off people's machines, you probably know that when you get there, the thing is just wildly infested. And it's because the problem's just gone on there for a long time. They just haven't bothered to deal with it. And there's lots of unpatched systems out there. A lot of these vulnerabilities are the way in for viruses and malware to get on these machines, yet a lot of people are still not patching. The top five reported exploited corporate computer vulnerabilities have had patches available for months. There was a recent breach of the MSN server in South Korea where it was discovered that there were password grabbing utilities on this machine for three days before it was detected by an external company that was scanning machines. Now, it's not Microsoft's fault in this case, really, because they outsourced the management of this machine, but this machine, this outsourced management company, had failed to patch the Server 2003 system and keep it up to date, letting the hackers get on it. And Service Pack 2, you all know, Microsoft said the big message there is security, 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 and yet in March of this year, Asset Metrics surveyed 250 companies in the U.S. and found that less than one quarter of them had deployed Service Pack 2 on their XP systems. So we know, I hope I've established that fighting malware is a, a big problem and it's getting bigger. There's some other reasons that fighting malware should be a top concern. And one is it interferes with the productivity of you and your end users. It, it slows down machines, and we've seen that. It's a constant support burden to your IT staff. It opens the door to financial and corporate theft. In fact, alarming statistics, 17% of 100 companies surveyed by Carnegie Mellon and Information Week say they've been blackmailed by hackers saying that they'll attack their uh, their data unless they pay the money. And it's just a matter of time before there's a major terrorist, terrorist incident in cyberspace unless we all take measures to lock down our systems. We're leaving the door wide open for this kind of attack. And in February of this year, the Inter uh, Information Technology Advisory Council submitted a report to the President of the United States entitled Cybersecurity, a Crisis and Priorities, where they say, point blank, this country is not prepared for a coordinated, premeditated attack on this cyber infrastructure, neither the government nor corporations. And that leaves the door open for cyber terrorism as well as criminal activity. So the point of this talk is to give you tools and help you understand what malware is. And by understanding it, you can fight it. Let's talk about viruses first. So some basic definitions here. A virus is just a program that recursively uh, replicates itself. A worm, on the other hand, is a virus that replicates itself on the network, usually without any user interaction. The, uh, 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 the uh, exception to this rule is the mass mailer worms, where somebody actually has to click open an attachment to get to launch the worm, and then it spreads by emailing itself to other users. I'll use the term virus, though, to include both of these categories. An exploit is the code that actually targets the vulnerability to get onto a system, and a payload is the virus body that's deployed after the exploit is successful, that's going to be the piece of malicious code that's sitting there grabbing passwords, destroying data, sending out confidential information. And the zero a day attack is a vulnerability that's undisclosed that malware takes advantage of. So a virus hacker writer figures out there's a buffer overflow vulnerability in some piece of software and nobody else knows about it. Now they've got this opportunity to go infect a lot of machines before the security community can respond to it. So antivirus, as the primary, one of the primary lines of defense against this type of software, scans files for viruses. And scanning relies on a virus signature database. And it, a lot of people don't realize this, but there's lots of types of viruses that pack themselves or compress themselves, encrypt themselves, in order to try to hide the fact that they're carrying malicious code and try to make it harder for the antivirus scanners to go and figure out and see really if there's a virus in there. So most modern antivirus technology uh, products have virtual machine technology in them where they will actually let 